I'm an academic at UCL, but also I'm the academic director of the UKCMB, which is the first center that had been created to look at moisture in general. And um, as you can probably listen from my uh, accent, I'm not from this country, I'm from Chile, I'm an architect, and I came to study here and to research on the health impact of buildings. But when I arrived 18 years ago, the challenge at that time was to look at mold in buildings and actually assess part F of the building regulations and trying to understand if actually what was say in the regulation was correct from a mold point of view. And, uh, and since then I have been working around mold and, um, and I was asked today to talk about diagnostic and which is something extremely difficult. And this is what I, 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 I thought that probably let's try to understand what are the challenges behind doing a proper diagnostic. Um, which are a few of them. I have this slide that says current problem because there are some, some researchers that says that in the Bible, actually in the Old Testament, uh, it says that mold was an issue, but actually that is not true. And I can tell you because as part of my research, I have to go to the Bible and the Old Testament and I have to check if actually it was a problem from the Old Testament. And at that time, actually there wasn't a problem with mold and was wrongly translated to mold in English. So from Hebrew to English was translated as a, as a mold. But actually what it says in the Old Testament is um, leprosy. They refer to leprosy. But anyway, it's a current problem. And this is not new. As I said, 18 years ago, I was looking at mold and there's the English health conditions and a lot of research that had been done around mold and reports of mold in this country has been since well, 1982 and probably earlier. And as um, Teresa mentioned, the, uh, that, that you talk about 10, 10 million homes affected by mold, but probably is, is a lot more. And it's gonna depend on who is reporting. Um, you can see here the English health conditions, the uh, Northern Ireland house conditions, EFUS and shelter, they all report in different numbers. And I have the feeling that now based on what happened a couple of years ago with the child that died in, in Manchester, actually numbers are a lot higher and we're putting a lot more attention on the problem. This is not just a problem in the UK, this is a worldwide problem and uh, I just have a few uh, papers from uh, China and also from North uh, Europe, but I can tell you that in, in the US, in Canada, in South America, in, 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 um, in Australia, I mean, there is a problem everywhere. It's not just here. And um, we associate most of our problem in this country because of cold and, 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 and fuel poverty. But in other countries also, depending on, on air conditionings, on the type of building that is, is that are created. Now, as we all know, mold in buildings have a, a large effect and uh, has an effect on aesthetic of the building, has a cost on maintaining and repairing uh, mold issues. But I want to stop on the health of the occupants and not just the physical health, which is something that is well reported, uh, but it's also on the mental health, which is there's not enough uh, research around that. And, um, and as some of the researchers that I found pointed out, there is some kind of symptoms that are linked to depression and anxiety and mental disorders. So living in, in a moldy home could be more than complex than we really think. But the question is what we are dealing with. And I think this is what I want you as a, as a message today with my presentation is what is mold, okay? Because all of us, we are aware that this black thing growing in buildings exist. We have probably seen in our own homes, or if you are uh, surveyors or uh, you go to homes of residents, you can see it in many homes. And, uh, but actually mold is not that bad, okay? And they play a really important role on breaking down death materials, organic materials, and actually has been linked with, with health products like penicillium that was created with, thanks to uh, Alexander Fleming, that is the gentleman that you see there, that actually was playing with bacteria in a petri dish that you can see here. And at some point he saw that a particular uh, mold spore uh, from penicillium uh, start to grow around bacteria. And you can see how actually the bacteria start to escape from the mold growing. So he, he thought, wow, there is something here. And this is how the penicillium actually was created. But also mold play a really, really important role in our food 
So there's many products that we eat thanks to mold and, and mold species. And, uh, and there's more. There's some uh, recent research that actually mold growing in, in, in plants, in woods, etc., can uh, store quite a vast amount of uh, carbon that we produce. So it's, they, they play a really important role. It's not just about the bad things. And, um, and here I'm going to talk about what actually mold is telling us. If you see that mold is growing in homes, it's because the house has a problem. And I want to think about mold as a messenger. And, and this is extremely important because as um, Simon was saying, we have this idea of moisture balance. A house sometimes is going to be exposed to high levels of humidity, sometimes it's going to be dry. But this, like us, we are, our immune system sometimes is okay, sometimes is bad. And I want to think that mold, when mold starts to grow in a building, is because that balance has been broken. And an analogy to this is if you wake up this morning with fever, you know that actually you're, there's something wrong in your body, but you don't know what. And this is why you go to the doctor, and the doctor is going to help you identify what is the cause and the, the real symptom, so, or the, the cause of that particular fever. So you need to think that mold is that. Mold is growing in homes because there is an imbalance in your building, and that imbalance is an excess of moisture. That water or that excess of moisture is coming, can come from many sources. Um, but one thing that is important is that mold growth on surfaces, okay, no an air. And, and, and there is a, a number of uh, life cycles uh, uh, within the mold. So mold, you have, to have a, a small mold spore. There's plenty in this room. And as soon as they get in contact with the surface, the, if the conditions are the correct, when I said the conditions, temperature, nutrients, but the more important water that is going to germinate, as you, say, as you see there. This is more than a surface germination. And then the growth also need other environmental conditions, which is again the same, but another levels of water. And then for sporulation, which is actually when more spores are produced, you need another levels of conditions. So when you see more growing in, on, 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 on surfaces, on buildings, actually what you see there is the latest stage of this mold cycle and the life. And what is really important is that they need different conditions, as I said, and depending on the mold species, going to need more or less water. And what is showing you here, this is an isoplate system, where you see uh, in this axis uh, relative humidity, and in this axis temperature. Okay? And basically for different mold species, you can see that the requirements of humidity is completely different. And some of them, they need a lot of water, like for example, the mold that grows on, on corners in a toilet, in a bathroom, or in the kitchen sink. That mold is completely different to the mold that is gonna grow on a surface in a room. Now, I talk about the species, and I really like this slide because it shows uh, how magnificent fungus are. And as you can see there, you, can, you, you see a lizard. And every year, probably if you, if you look at the newspaper or in the, in the media, you're going to see that that new species of some kind of animal is discovered around the world. Okay? And this is a lizard that was discovered uh, last year in India. And if I ask you about plants, probably if I ask you about a particular uh, flower, Probably in the room, we're going to be able to have a, a massive garden. So some of you are going to, be, are going to say rose, orchids, uh, lilies, etc., etc. And within the orchid family, you can see that there are between 22 and 26,000 species. But if I ask you about mold, how many of you know mold species? I mean, any one of you can name more than five mold species? No. So how do we know how to deal with them? And I think this is really important. This is start to, to, to show the challenges of dealing with mold. <coughs> so there are many, many mold species. All of them grow and, and have different environmental conditions. You can see here just six of the species that at some point I was working with. They look different. They grow in a different patterns. They require different environmental conditions. And as you see, mold spores from the different species are completely also different. And, uh, and this is just an example of um, mold growing on feet. And there are between 80 and 100 mold species. So this is a whole world, and it's extremely complex. 
And going back to the moisture balance, I want to stress that it's extremely important that if, if you see mold, it's because there is this imbalance. And what we have been advising in terms of how to deal with mold is um, stop water entering from, from, build, uh, from outside. So any kind of external source reducing extra moisture, which is the activities that we have indoors. Um, proper heating, including improvement of the building envelope. This is what we are advising. And efficient and consistent ventilation. But the question is, is that that simple when you do diagnostic? And I'm going to show you three case studies to show how complex the problem is if you want to do a proper diagnostic, what is the problem or the cause of mold. So I have this first image, which is mold growing next to a radiator in an apartment in London. This is an apartment of one of my uh, PhD students that he ran in London. He lived in Bath, but he goes from time to time to the apartment. And the person who was one of the, his friends that was occupying the building uh, during a period that he was in secondment uh, called him and said, you know what, I have a problem with mold. And he sent these pictures. So the first thing that my PhD student told this guy was, well, open the window. There's a lack of ventilation. And probably this is what you all, we all will think about. But actually, a couple of days after, we have that patch, which is the same spot. Okay? So what could you think that could be now, now the cause of this? Any guess? Yes, exactly, and that is a problem. And that is exactly what happened in this apartment. So the initial diagnostic was a lack of ventilation, but actually what happened is that the gutter was broken and it was just leaking, and this is from outside. So that is why doing diagnosis sometimes is quite complex if you don't, do at the, you don't know what could be all the causes. Now, another example is this particular bungalow um, in North London. Uh, this is a student accommodation, and uh, you have families living in these bungalows. And what we found is mold growing on the ceiling there. So the first approach was, again, lack of ventilation. But actually, the problem here was too much ventilation. I don't know if you remember, but during December, I think, or January, there were a few weeks that were extremely cold. Was there the only cold, well, I don't know here in Suffolk, but probably in London, where there was a few weeks extremely cold. The problem is that the uh, tenants was, uh, they would keep the windows open during the whole winter, okay? And this is a window on a, on a bathroom. And what happened, because it was so cold, the ceiling was extremely cold too. So actually you have a, a perfect spot for a, a little of humidity to condense, or to have high levels of humidity and then mold growing. So here the problem is not a lack of ventilation, but it is actually too much ventilation where actually you don't need it. And the final example is this, the same housing association, sorry, um, uh, student accommodation. And we visit this uh, apartment and you have this mold next to the bed. There is a couple living there. And, and the problem here was lack of ventilation, was too much moisture production because it was a family from a particular country that they used to cook a lot, a lot, a lot every day. You have a husband going to, uh, to study at uni, and then you have a woman staying at home and cooking for the husband, and not opening the windows because they arrive in London from a country, a hot country, so actually in, uh, in December, January, um, for them was extremely cold, and they, they didn't open the windows. But also, um, a problem with the building envelope which actually you have some cold bridges, as you can see there. So it's a combination of factors. It's not always just one. It could be that if you improve the, the build them envelope, probably you're gonna solve the problem, but may not because still you're producing too much humidity. It could be that you just reduce the humidity and that is gonna be the solution. But depends, because it could be that the building envelope is too poor and actually still with a really low level of humidity, you're gonna create some problems. Anyway. So going back to the challenges and um, in diagnosing, diagnosing mold in building, I think this is quite important and I have just um, put a few of them. So it's really difficult to understand people's behavior 
We know that actually the issue is not people behavior, but every one of us, we use our homes in different ways. And, um, and we, don't, we don't have enough information. And sometimes it's, it's complex to say, well, it's too much moisture production, but uh, uh, people's fault. But what exactly is happening in this home is something that we don't know. Um, and influencing patterns are affected by biofactors. In this case, overcrowding is a big issue, fuel poverty, energy efficiency, and heritage values. In terms of ventilation and moisture control and heating, um, I think there is a, a lack of comprehensive knowledge on what a, a poor or proper ventilation means. If you go to a home, how do you really assess if it's a lack of ventilation or not? And that is quite complex in itself, as, as uh, Simon was saying. I mean, ventilation is a, is, a, is a topic that needs a lot of study. We know a lot, but it's, it's quite complex for us to go to a home and say, well, there's a problem with ventilation. What is an effect, effective heating? How much heating we need to provide in a, in, in a, in a building to actually keep humidity levels low? Um, and also we need to think on climate and, and heating regimes and, and diverse climate conditions. I mean, London is different to uh, other parts of, of, of the country. Uh, materials and building performance. Um, we don't understand too well the properties of the, uh, the materials or the, the performance of a building. No, every single building is, is the same. In this country, we have a building store that is quite old. We don't know what the materials have been created. We need to also acknowledge that there is a climate change and the context, and that also is going to play an enormous role on how the building is going to perform. And, and there is a dynamic nature of influential factor, which means that you have a number of factors, ventilation, heating, uh, building envelope, et cetera, they're gonna play at some point uh, a same role. Challenges with mold, which is, we don't know enough about mold. And this is, I have been working, as I said, from 18 months, for the last 18 uh, years so with mold, and still there's so much that we don't know. We are still carrying out experiments, trying to understand what are the perfect conditions to, for them to grow. Um, but also there is an adequate record, a recording method. So, Every single council or every single uh, institution record mold in a different way. So we, don't, we cannot compare the, the number of homes with mold. Um, the housing uh, survey, the survey, how it's called? The um, housing survey uh, um, that I mentioned at the beginning, there are different methods. Every year they use different methods to record the, uh, the housing with mold. So it's really complex to actually even compare them. And uh, looking at the, uh, the, 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 the future, climate change and mold development, uh, there's going to be a, a shift in temperature and humidity, so we're going to have different patterns. Um, we're going to have more extreme cases of, of, of events, so flooding and uh, rain, etc. We are doing a lot on retrofitting, so we are assuming that by doing retrofitting we're improving the conditions, but there's is, there is a number of unintended consequences that we know that may happen, so we need to be quite careful with the retrofitting system. And what, something that is really important, mold, like animals and plants, they are going to adapt. So at some point they may, uh, we may have new species growing in buildings, and even if we are dealing with mold, we are going to have uh, other uh, conditions that could be excellent for, for this mold to appear. And new species, probably as with animals and plants, we're going to discover new species in the future. Now, one thing that we are doing with the UK CMB, and I was asked to present this, is um, we have a number of resources, and I'm going to just mention a few of them. So actually, if you want, you can go to the website, you can download the information that we have. We have a number of tools that I think it could be quite useful for you. There are two animations, um, one that is uh, a guidance for existing homeowners that explains some of the, the, the theory behind humidity in buildings, but also explain what some problems could occur like mold and damp and condensation. And this is a relatively new animation, which is four minutes. And it says, it's, it's called a bit more information about mold. It's a really simple animation. And the whole idea of this is to tell you um, that mold is not that bad, but also how we can uh, prevent at home. We have also uh, a tool which is called the moisture balance calculator, which is 
following this idea of the moisture balance, it can tell you if your home is in unbalance or not, and what could be the cause of that unbalance. And it's a really uh, nice and, and friendly tool. So what you're gonna be asked, this is how it looks. You're gonna be asked a number of questions around moisture generation, a number of questions about occupancy, about building, building conditions, that your heating and your ventilation, and, and this is an example, for example, about one of the questions related to moisture generation. How, many, how often does your household have long, steamy bath or showers? And based on all of this, and then when you answer this questionnaire, you're gonna to come to three options. One is possible out of balance, out of balance completely and in balance. And if you are possibly out of balance or out of balance, it's gonna tell you what could what you can improve in that home. So it's a really simple tool, but it can help you when, if you have um, a relationship with the tenants to understand what happened in their homes. The other tool that I want to mention, which is, is basically a guide, is about uh, for new homes, but I, th I think this applies also to existing homes. And the whole message behind this uh, guidance is uh, to tell residents that your home is full of water. Every time that you receive a new home, it's gonna be completely covering water. And it can take one or two years to actually get to that balance, okay? So expect during the first year that mold is gonna appear, crack is gonna appear, so something in your home is gonna, is gonna, is gonna happen. Um, but also I give you some indication of what to do if you have dampness or you have mold. And um, this is, again, it's a really basic and simple and was created a, a number of, of, of um, years ago. And finally, um, we have created some training courses and I was, I was asked to probably mention this, one which is understanding and managing moisture risk in buildings. They have been running for the last, I mean, five years, I think. And, um, and it's based on a white paper that was written by Neil May and Chris Sanders a couple of years ago. And we are about to launch a new course, which is an online course, it's three weeks. It's, it's, it's the platform is part of Future Learn, and it's called uh, Condensation Number Modeling Buildings. And trying to cover theory, history, and some of the stuff that actually um, Housing Association and Council can do to improve the conditions in, in homes of their residents. And I'm gonna finish there with that slide just to visit our website. Um, I'm not trying to advertise the website, but actually <laughs> the, whole, the whole idea is that, that in some way you, um, there's a lot of these tools that we are creating uh, based on the public interest. Um, we try to get funding from other bodies to create these kind of tools. Um, and obviously with the purpose of imp um, improving, as I said there, the knowledge and understanding of moisture buildings uh, uh, in the UK. Um, we have created an international conference on motion building because we are trying to contact with, uh, get contact with, uh, with uh, international academics and uh, an industry also for, uh, participate in this, in this industry. It's not just in this conference, so it's not just about academic, but it's also what is happening in terms of industry. So, thanks for listening, and uh, I hope to have questions at the end of the, the session. Brilliant.